Hey guys, welcome back. In this video, we're going to look at how to fit an AR model to real data. So in the last video, we looked at ice cream production data, and we looked at the ACF and PACF of this data to maybe figure out how to fit an AR model. In this video, we'll actually fit that AR model. So the beginning of this video, we'll be going through all the same steps, but in much less detail since we already saw reading in the data. So I read in the data in a slightly different way now that I've learned a little bit more about efficiently reading in data. I still use the pd.readcsv function and read in this icecream.csv file, which I'll link in the description. And there's a couple of options here. I'll just explain the main ones. These options are just so that I don't have to do any processing later on by myself. I just do it in this option so that the data gets read in, in a much cleaner format. So the key options here are parse dates, index call, and date parser. These basically say that I want to treat the zeroth column of my data, or the first column of my data really, as my date and I want to set that as my index immediately. And how do you parse that date? Use this very simple parser function where you take it as a year, month, and day. So that's all that does. And when I read in the data and rename the series, this is now a series as production, this is my series. So I have every month since 1972 January until 2020 January, and I have the level of ice cream production in the United States. So the next couple things are just a little bit more data processing. I need to infer the frequency of the data. I can see it's monthly, but I need it to be set as monthly so that the plots and analysis go a little bit smoother going forward. So I can just use this function in pandas called as frequency and pd.infer frequency in this way to infer the frequency as beginning of the month, because each of my dates is the beginning of its respective month. Now, again, as in the ACF PACF video, I'm going to subset the data so that we can target our attention just on how to fit an AR model instead of the volume of data. So I'm going to start in 2010 and just go to 2020. And so here's the same exact series you saw in the ACF PACF video. We see that we have ice cream production every month from 2010 to 2020. We see there's a seasonal pattern. And as we saw in those videos, we did the ACF, saw that it's diminishing over time, did the PACF, saw a couple of spikes and decided that, okay, let's try fitting an AR model. What kind of AR model should we try? Well, we see there's strong spikes at 1, 2, 3, and then later on there are strong spikes. Maybe we'll start with just an AR3 model to keep things simpler and see if we have to make it more complicated or not. So here is how we start fitting an AR model to our data. Something we're going to want to do is evaluate the strength of our AR model. So we need a training set and a testing set. The training set will say goes from 2010 to 2018 uh, December. The testing set starts one month later, so 2019 January, and ends in 2019 December. So looking at it graphically, we're using the first one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine years as training, and we're trying to predict this last year right here. So we generate our training data basically by taking our production data and going up until the end of the training. We generate our test set by taking our production data and starting at training data plus one day, just so it starts at the next time period, and going to the end of our testing. So this is how we generate our training and testing data. Now we fit the AR model, so we use this ARMA function, and where does it come from? It's something I import from statsmodels.timeseriesanalysis.arima model, we import ARMA. So this lets us very easily fit an ARMA model. It just takes two arguments in the order, the AR and the MA. Since this video is about fitting an AR model, our MA part is zero. And as decided before, we're gonna start with a lag three AR model. We put in the data we would like to train on, which is our training data. And then we go ahead and fit the model using simply model, which is the result of this command, dot fit. And it already knows what data to fit on because we fed it in at the time we created the model. I also looked at how long it takes to fit the model. So if it's just a simple AR3 model, it takes only about 0.23 seconds on my machine. So not super long. But something we won't do is that if I put in an AR13 model, and I said 13 because that's the strong lag here, it actually ends up taking about a minute to train. So you can see that this thing is going up rather quickly as we add more lags. Now here's the important part that I want to uh, analyze for a little while. When we do model fit, which is the result of fitting the model, dot summary, we get all of this information. Now, there's a lot of good information here, but I'll just direct your attention to the important stuff. There's some information at the top about what kind of model you ran and when you ran the model, but the most important part is this table down here. So this table down here basically tells you the importance of each lag that you chose to include in your model. So there's a couple of different predictors here. There's a constant, which is just the coefficient, 
And the corresponding column you want to focus your attention on is p greater than z. This is something called a p-value, if you're not familiar. And the lower the p-value is, usually we want it to be less than 0 0.05, the more significant this factor is in our prediction. So the constant you can see has a p-value of nearly 0, so it's very important. The next one is the lag1, so ar.lag1 production. We see that's also very, very, very significant. We see the next one, lag2, actually has a very high p-value. So p-values range between 0 and 1. And anything bigger than 0.05, we usually classify that as not important. This is well above 0 0.05. So the lag2 actually is not important for us. Now lag3 is important because the p-value, again, is very close to 0. So my final conclusion, if I was just going up to an AR3 model, would be I want to build the model with lag1 and lag3 excluding lag 2 because I've seen that it's not significant. So that's how to read this analysis right here. Now let's go ahead and try to predict that last year that we did not train on and see if the prediction is any good. So the prediction start date and end date are gotten here. And then you simply do model fit, which again is the result of fitting your model. You do model fit dot predict. You put in the start date for a prediction and the end date for the prediction. The residuals are going to be test data, which is the year that I did not train on, minus the predictions I just got in the line above. So this is how off I am. The last things we'll look at in this video are plotting the residuals. So here are the residuals for that last year, 2019, all 12 months of 2019. We see that the residuals are maybe centered around zero, but they're definitely decreasing over time. So there is a clear pattern in the residuals, which is typically not something that we want. So I would say this is an indication that there's something in the dynamics of the data that we did not capture with this model. The other thing we'll look at is plotting the predictions versus the actual values. So in blue here, you have your actual data. So the actual ice cream production for every month of 2019. And in orange here, you have your predictions. You can see in the beginning, it's not bad, but something with time series that we've looked at in the evaluating your time series model video is that as you get to longer and longer time periods in the future, your model is going to deteriorate, not be very good at prediction. And that's something we can already see, right? In the beginning, it's okay. But as we get to the middle of the month, as we get to the middle of the year and beyond, the model kind of starts getting rather far away from the actual data we're trying to predict. The last couple things I'll print out are some metrics about how good or bad we're doing. The first one is mean absolute percent error. This is a long title, but it basically just means that on average, how what percent away are we from our actual target? And we see that using an AR3 model, we're about 9% away on average. So not great, but not terrible. Another metric we might look at is root mean squared error, which is basically just taking the residuals, squaring them, taking the mean, and then taking the square root. So we see we're about 10 units of production away on average for predicting on this last year. Now the very last thing I look at in this video is what if we make our model more complicated? So we did all this just training on an AR3 model as informed by our PACF. What's the next one we might want to try? So one, two, three are significant. Then we have four, five, six, seven. Seven ends up being significant. So maybe we can try on an AR7 model. So if I slightly just tweak this, make this three a seven instead, and run all of these cells again. The first thing to note is that it took two seconds to train this time, so the time is definitely going up as we increase the lag, which makes sense because the model is getting more and more complicated. Let's look at the summary again. Now the summary, there's many more terms to consider, but we can again see that lag one, significant, not lag two, lag three is still significant, not lag four, not lag five, lag six and seven are significant. So again, always check this table to see which of your lags should be included in the final model and which of them can be excluded because they're not helping at all. We can again get the predictions and the residuals. So if we plot the residuals, we see they look kind of the same, same kind of pattern decreasing over time. If we plot the predicted versus actual values, we see that it looks maybe a little bit better. Maybe these are a little bit closer, but more or less nothing has changed drastically. If we recompute these before we had a 9% mean absolute percent error, now it's about 8%, so we got a little bit of help, but not a lot for adding four extra lags. The root mean squared error is going from 9.8 to 8.7, so a little bit better again. So, you know, it's really your call in the end about whether this was worth it. I would say it's probably not because we didn't get too much of an improvement, but we added a good amount of complexity into our model. So I would say maybe it's not worth it in this case.
As with a lot of time series analysis, the final judgment call is up to the person who's analyzing the data, and that only comes with doing a bunch of these problems and seeing what works for you in certain situations. But this was a look at using real code and real data to fit your AR models. All right, so until next time.